We're joined today on It's Art, Let's Talk About It by uh, two good friends of ours at the museum, uh, Leanne Watley, who was the curator for Glory and Grime, the art of Suzanne Vincent, and Catherine McIntyre, who's uh, Suzanne's daughter. And together, uh, they put together, helped put together a show called Glory and Grime, the art of Suzanne Vincent. And ladies, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is a lot of fun. And we've wrapped up, by the time people hear the podcast, we will have wrapped up Glory and Grime, the art of Suzanne Vincent, on a, a multi-week run here at the Museum of Western Art. And by most measures, all measures, actually, what a great little show it was. It yeah. was a really wonderful show. For yeah, the for those of you who don't know, Glory and Grime, the art of Suzanne Vincent, features the work of Suzanne Vincent, who's a Gulf Coast, Texas, and Gulf Coast, Louisiana artist who documented her lifestyle and, and her life over a, gosh, a number of years, 50-year period or longer, and documented in really in some really glorious ways the uh, ranching lifestyle that she uh, married into and some of the grime that she was associated with over the years, the hurricanes and cattle and all of those things. And it was a fascinating show. And Leanne, let's talk for just a second about how this all came about. How did we first start talking about doing an exhibition of glory and grime, the art of Suzanne Vincent? This all came about because of Catherine McIntyre, who had salvaged her mother's artwork from Hurricane Laura. Uh, Hurricane Laura devastated her studio and the work had to be rescued. She had brought it to me to talk about what we can do with this art in terms of we had to get it restored. But where do we go from there? And that's when we approached you yeah. because this show needed to be seen on a larger scale. And we and I started talking about it 18 months or almost two years ago when we first started visiting about it. The shows take a long time to, to produce. And even though this show will have come down by the time people listen to the podcast, I, I want to remind everybody if they're playing along at home, they can go out to the Museum of Western Art.com, go to exhibitions page. And under the past exhibition pages, there'll be a link for Glory and Grime. And not only is a, there's a, a stuff about Suzanne and, and the work out there, there's the actual Glory and Grime catalog, the e-catalog, if you will, that was out there that's uh, sitting in front of us here at the, at the studio. But uh, it documents the show that's on the wall. Every single piece that was in the show is in the catalog. And there's an essay by you, Leanne, and that, that's been very well received. Glory and Grime... Suzanne's work is not traditional fare here at the Museum of Western Art. And it's just not. It's not cowboys on a horse looking left and cowboys on a horse looking right. It's, and you know, that's something we don't do often here at the Museum of Western Art. We don't get philosophically deep. It's, like I say, cowboys and horses and Indians and that kind of thing. But, Leanne, what first brought you to the art? What drew you in to the art? Stylistically, her work was expressionistic. <laughs> It was emotive. I liked the free, free style that she had, where I seemed to be learning. The way I came, a very highly trained style. But personally, what drew me to her work was the emotive quality that runs through all of her artworks and the cohesiveness of the subject matter. And for those of you, you know, want to play along, you can look at the photographs in the, in the book as we, we go along. And one of the things that a lot of people are going to, are, they're already asking themselves is, why are we interviewing Suzanne? So let's talk about your mom, her health right now. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's a number of years back, and that's why she's not involved personally in this expedition here. That's right. She's not here deeply with us today. She's here in spirit yeah. through this art, yeah. through the, the clues, the words she left behind, and... I'm proud to try to speak for her, and I try to use her own words. I'll tell you something about her here and her quote. There is a harmony in nature that does not exist in the city. The sky, the land, the trees, all seem to exist in harmony. The chaos of city life is devoid of the harmony and the wholeness of country life. The continuous sound of the wind, the movement and swirls of the bayou waters, the curve of the sky, the clouds, and the stars, and the fields of grasses, and the forms of the trees and animals. That's pretty cool for a woman who grew up in Houston, Texas. For a city girl. <laughs> she certainly adapted. City girl, she certainly life. got the, 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 the gist of the rural life and, and all of that. 
Um, we've talked a lot about one of the things that we do here at the Museum of Western Art is a lot of uh, commercial art, a lot of art that is for sale. Um, even though she had sold and she's had numerous exhibitions over her life, I see a lot of her work as being more academic in its nature, very well studied, studied under some great master artist to become one herself. But it was not a commercial, necessarily commercial success kind of career in the arts. It was documentation. It was designed to tell a story, the story of the Gulf Coast of Texas, of cattle ranching, of a strong woman in that environment. Wouldn't you say that's a... Yeah, she did achieve commercial success exhibiting and selling in right. Meredith Long in Houston. Right. And then my dad opened a restaurant <laughs> with the family in 1983. Yeah. As she says herself, her paint brushes were exchanged for knives and forks. Yeah, doing and what the family needed done. Uh, they ran a restaurant during the week and a ranch on the weekend. And her art did have to be on hold for various times in her life, depending on what was going on, raising four children, taking care of an aging mother, just life itself. But she kept painting. And Leanne, you came to this you came to this project as a in a client relationship with Catherine. She brought you some work, is that, that correct? That is correct. Yeah. And saw the potential in this and we started talking about putting together a show of the work. And let's talk about it real quickly, because I don't want to do too many commercial advertisements, but you do run a company in Fredericksburg, Texas called Opera Tiare. Opera Tiare. This is tough Opera one. Opera Tiare. For you country folks out there listening, that means? It's Latin, and it means to hold and maintain value. And cool. my studio is a full framing studio. I do art appraisals, and I do curatorial services. And if somebody were to want to seek you out on the internet, how would they do that or out in person? Here's your plug. Get okay. your plug in the way. Yeah, the fastest way to get a hold of me is going to be my phone number, 830-456-0374. My website is operatfbg.com, and I bet you're going to want me to spell that. I'm going to want you to spell that. <laughs> Actually, what we'll do is we'll put that link on our website so people can go out there and, and look at it. It located in downtown Fredericksburg. Mm -hmm. 237 West Main. It's right next to the Fredericksburg Winery behind George's Bakery, there German you go. Bakery. Everybody knows where that is. So if you're in the area and you want to visit with Leanne and see her studio and what she's doing, the work that includes restoration, conservation, framing. For this framing. particular scope of work for Suzanne Vincent, we had to do the whole thing. We had to restore the artworks and then archivally frame the artworks. And then we researched her life's work and then we wrote a an essay for the exhibition catalog. Leanne did a fabulous job of taking pieces that were still wet and damp. Yeah, I was going to ask, why did we have to restore anything? Let's talk about that. The hurricanes. Of the four most recent, the one in 2020 right. is the one that destroyed the art studio. But having been warned in a dream to move them, I, I mean, moved them a to a store. Why did we have to restore anything? We could have just left them the way they were. We, but there is a an archival aspect of the mold that sure. could still be breeding, the breakdown of the paint and the paper. We and weren't going to allow you to be in the museum that. with any kind of, you know, it's important gonna... to stop that process <laughs> so that we can <laughs> enjoy it for years to come. Yeah, in Cuban environment in South Louisiana and in, in the Gulf Coast, a lot of the paintings end up sticking to the glass. Yeah. Leanne artfully took that and restored them. I actually kept you from having a heart attack. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> but your mom, Catherine, your mom is, is uh, uh, not able to, to be with us for this show because uh, her health has failed. That's right. Let's uh, back to that for real quickly. The... Uh, my mother has Alzheimer's, and she fell and broke her hip. That last storm really did do a number on her health, and she's not here to talk to you today. Um other than through her words and her well, That was one of my concerns early on, honestly, that a lot of times when we deal with artists, of course, with a lot of living artists, occasionally we've got some of the old dead guys, if you will, from the past, the Taos Masters and things like that. But most of the exhibitions we do, um, uh, Billy Shank came, comes to mind. We have the actual artist here. And that was a concern of mine. But I, I will admit, and I have to admit freely, boy, this family came together like nobody's business to uh, Always represent... Suzanne Vincent and her work. Everywhere I went, every opening night, 200 and over 200 people were here. And I was hearing Suzanne Vincent stories about this painting, that painting, this story, that story, the 
I know the background of that. I, I don't know how much of it was true, but boy, the family sure had the we embellished they, the stories that that were coming out. So you think she would be a, very pleased with the way this show was handled? And I think she would be delighted, and yeah. I think she is delighted with the joy she's expressed. She loved her family, and the fact that they came here, as always, to support her is a testament to the family and their love for her. Yeah. Let's talk about her art real quickly. It's not the typical fare of a Western art museum. It's not, like I said, cowboys on a cowboys on a horse looking left or looking right. But let's talk about that art. Yes. I think art, historically speaking, when we think about Western art, we think about the pioneering aspect the West, the great Western expansion and the cattle drives yeah. and the cowboys. And we don't experience that today. We experience that's become nostalgia. What we, what I feel like is important for Suzanne is that she is still living that cattle drives, the working the cattle, the ranch life. And it's bringing it contemporary and bringing it now and through a woman's perspective. Yeah. Talk about that. There's a quote in your essay, Leanne, about the cows in the movies are always well-behaved. They're going in the same direction or something to that end because Suzanne didn't see it that way. She talked about these darn cattle don't behave themselves. You can get a person to sit pretty on a couch and paint them and maybe for a good 45 minutes, yeah. right? Or a still life it's you, you, or working from a photograph. But she was working with these cattle that are constantly moving and mooing and pooping and peeing and everything else that they do. <laughs> Another first, I think it's the first time poop and pee have been mentioned on this, <laughs> this podcast, but that's okay. But it's very much but, a part of but Sure. You, you don't come home from a cattle ranch without some poop on you. Yeah. Okay. And to quote her exactly, she wrote, my paintings are about the real cowboy of today, who's sometimes a girl. The herd of cattle is not calm, quiet, and toilet trained, but rather rough, <laughs> frightened, and hungry. Not toilet trained, no toilet trained cattle. Yeah. It's an interesting thing. Talk about some of your favorites in the show, both of you. And they don't have to be the same ones, but Leanne, you have some favorites in the show that people can look up in the catalog and tell us why. The first piece that I framed was probably my, my best memory because that was my first exposure to her work, which was Surge. Mm -hmm. And it was paint the painting of an aftermath of af after a hurricane of a skull and some sticks. I was trying to think right. of, okay, the trees that have had their limbs removed, the, they've just boiled down to sticks. But it's a very emotive piece, and that's what captured me, the first one. But moving on from there and getting into her work stylistically, the piece that I, I feel like is ingrained in my mind is reticence of night, which is more of an archetypal female perspective, very symbolic how you have this shrouded right, figure right. holding a skull. And I, I'm not sure that's something that she would have ne necessarily uh, seen, but she staged and to evoke and make us think. And for those of you listening who want to play along with us, again, the Link on our website, museumofwesternart.com. You can go out to past exhibitions, the Glory and Grime, the artist Suzanne Vincent. There's a link there to read more about it and see more about it. And a couple of things, there's the actual catalog that we're referencing and talking about is there online and will remain online. And then there's also a video of opening night and some of the comments from guests who are gathered and all this. If you're talking about reticence of night, which is a striking, striking portrait of a woman in a skull. It's, and it's very small. You would think that piece would be very large. Yeah. And it's a smaller it's and it's a smaller work. And but you can see that both Leanne's talked about it in the essay and she's and we talk about it. We show it in the catalog. Some of the it's really funny, some of the, the pictures in the catalog are bigger than the actual paintings. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed in the, the wall, wall types <laughs> some, much bigger. some of the archive stuff she, and some of these they don't begin to do them justice looking back for example I think that's a very good point to make in that One the of, scale that she worked in ranged from very small two inches yeah. by three inches to mural size oh, seven eight feet and I mean some of the amazing size and everything paintings everything in between so it's diverse in that regard yeah so and I think and you can see that in the uh, video that we have online 
as the, the photographer went around shooting pictures, you can see some of the scale of some of this work and how well it's been received. But uh, Catherine, let's talk about your mom as a multifaceted faceted person. We tend to talk about artists as artists, and we forget that they're human beings. This is not just a woman who spent all her time painting. She did a lot of things. Yeah, she was a busy woman. A busy woman. So talk about her life, if you can, so people can get to know her better. My mother was born in Galveston, raised in Texas City. Her father was a journalist from a long line of journalists, right. Bray, the Bray family. So she, that's where she gets her documentation skills, Woodrow Straw. She went to University of Texas, studied art, and then after taking the summer school class at University of Houston, decided that's where she wanted to be. And she got her master's, first her Bachelor of Arts, and then her master's much later in 1983 graduating in 63 the first time. She was part of the dynamic vitality of Houston. She loved it there. Uh, they spent weekends at the farm in Louisiana and at the ranch in Texas where they actively worked. The family had a series of restaurants, the Cellar Door restaurants in Houston, Texas, where everybody was worked or volunteered and worked. <laughs> Voluntold. Yes. <laughs> Growing up, I'm going to... Uh, she used to decorate them and help design Along with the rest of the family, she designed Lavaca Bay, which they opened in 1983 in Houston. Mm -hmm. She designed and helped run Cafe Babahia, painted a mural there that was sensational, the bullpen, with various customers depicted and family members, <laughs> with Elvis and Marilyn Monroe also there in the crowd. That was one of her favorites. Um, but as Houston took a downturn, uh, a very heavy one in 1986. They eventually went back to the farm in Louisiana uh, by 1995, where her art career flourished again, and she was a professor at McNeese University, both taking classes and teaching classes there, and she had taught in Houston as well. Right. So those were some of her jobs. She raised four children, devout mother. She's been married 60 years, and as we all know, that's a job too. <laughs> <laughs> I was always dignified, always had time. She read a lot. She spent a lot of time with her grandchildren. And each her painting dropped off with each grandchild that was born when she was spending time. I think she would like you to know that she was she loved art, not just her own and studied many other artists. Right, right. I went to a lot of galleries and believed that it should be a part of your life. She always had a camera with her, taking photos of Clouds, birds, the sunset, the sunrise. She loved, she saw beauty everywhere that she was. She also revamped the interior design of Park Avenue Hospital. Oh, that's right. And she was a graphic designer or a graphic illustrator for oh, his brothers. Thanks. Yeah. Leanne, so Leanne's done such a good job chronicling her life. She reminded me of things she also. She's going to have to join the family and tell them to come and talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Sister Leanne now. <laughs> Before she moved to Louisiana, she did work in selling commercial arts from right. Fidelity Arts, selling Gordon Bethune at Continental Airlines, became a customer, and eventually owned some of her artwork. Right. She, yes, she was active in Houston doing that. And um, when she taught school. She taught school. We talk about the American West. Usually people think Texas, of, of course, they even include Kansas and Nebraska sometimes, but mostly it's Montana. It's the west of the Mississippi. And we often forget about the Gulf Coast of Texas, very much still the American West. It's a story that's not often told. Come of some of the largest ranches in the world, and most important cattle industry grew up in the Texas Gulf Coast. King Ranch comes to mind. Of course, your folks had a, a nice cattle, cow-calf operation and did a lot of stuff there. But I think fascinating to me is the documentation of the cattle industry from a Gulf Coast perspective. I'm glad you brought that up, Daryl, because it's true. As my dad says, they headed the east before they went west and north. And in the early days of Texas, the Spanish brought the cattle, and the first cattle drive was from Refugio and Goliad, Texas, for George Washington's troops, sure. where they moved the east and up to the Carolinas. And that was in 1780 to 83. So the cattle drives and the cattle markets were in New Orleans. One of our ancestors, Abel West, would take his cattle up the Gulf Coast, and they often had to buy land on the way. You couldn't just free range. And they would do some of the ancient trails, the Old Spanish Trail, the Saltgrass Trail, 
Creole Trail, Creole Trail Sabine Trail, and those exist before the Chisholm Trail. And one of the one, one of the reasons we wanted to do this show is this is a part of our world we don't explore very often. The you know museum industry, Museum of Western Art specifically, we do spend a lot more time with Chisholm and loving. And I think we had to learn about that in the fifth grade. Yeah, and but we don't talk about you know the Sabine Trail or the trails that are headed east and north, uh, the opposite direction. And I think your mom's work, Suzanne, did such a fabulous job of documenting um, what she saw. And so I think that's what's the power of the show is that it's very emotive, very emotional to me. One, one thing I've noticed about the show, um, a lot of the typical Western art is a very dry environment with rocks. My mother's art and a lot of the art of the Gulf Coast with the cattle is water. You, you're dealing with water and its ravages throughout and her paintings depict. And the salt water, and even. The drama. Yeah. yeah, and the, salt the dangerous salt water and the life and yeah. death of, of animals. One of the paintings that I want people to look at in the book is probably is one that was most important to me was a painting called Looking Back. What a tremendous, not only large painting, but tremendous composition of a cow looking back over her shoulder, tear in her eye. I think a real emotional thing is being forced into the floodwaters, trying to. And that painting is after a story that was told to me, and I think it's now a family legacy story, 200 head of cattle that were swept out to the ocean. And they swam in the ocean for two weeks before they, before many of them succumbed to the ocean. Right. The cowboys are out there on their pontoon boats with cranes and lifts trying to get these cows up out of the ocean and back to shore. Out of the salt water. Out of the salt yeah. water. Yeah. These cows were so tired and waterlogged that once they got them to the land, they died anyway. Yeah. That is such a vivid visual just in the storytelling. But the way she depicts it in this painting, you can see the fear, the struggle, and the doom. Yeah, it's a it's an incredible portrait of, of a cow. I mean, it's large, it's beautiful, it's well done. But the story of a cow looking back over her shoulder, saying, "My goodness, I'm about the, to." The, the subject matter is you know, rough. If you, you know, really, if you're yeah. really looking at it, we but talked you, about that as academic work. This tends to be a little more realistic than good clean cowboy sitting on a good clean horse and minding a bunch of good clean cows, right? It's this is not that work, right? This is not what she was documenting was the Hollywood aspect of. But it was, it's actually a beautiful painting too. I mean, yeah. the, the vibrant colors that she used and the swirling paint strokes and the lights and the darks and visually it's a very appealing. But when you start to think about what you're looking at is where it gets challenging. Yeah, no, it's some incredible works. And it was one of those things that you can see it you can see it small, you can see it in, in pictures, and we started putting together some. When we put them on the walls and get, got them lit, they were just, they really did light up. It was pretty impressive to be a part of. I do believe one of her professors at University of Houston inspired her to take on a little darker image. John Alexander had a huge influence, and he was an excellent teacher for her. And you can read all about that in Leanne's excellent essay in the book, Glory and Grime, the artist Suzanne Vincent. The link there is on the, the website. and. One thing that, that we kept going back and forth was I, I wanted to have this as an essay, and I kept telling Leanne, let's cut it down a little bit. Let's cut it down a little bit. But it's so inclusive. It's so very well done and thorough that I'm glad I didn't get my way completely on having it cut down. I don't so, know how we could have cut it down. Yeah, more, and that, that's, that's an important whole story. Once you yeah. read that, yeah, once you see that whole story, it becomes so very under you, you talk about her instructors her influences you talk about the the lifestyle and how it was forced to change would you say Catherine, that she had to put down her paintbrushes pick up knives and forks to yeah so i think that was that's an important part of her life and she and it's a very traditional female story that you're doing your passion and what you need to do life changes your husband's job changes completely reinvent yourself and keep going and returning to your passion, which hers was art. Yeah. It's just been fun to, to be a part of this. I'm sorry, people. We should have done this podcast eight weeks ago. I had it available for people and might have inspired a few more people to come by, but we still had great crowds. I think you were happy with the overall attendance of the show. People, so, lots of folks. Gosh, even today we had people from Houston and Beaumont, and it was fun to see people who came up just for the closing day of the show. And we've had a 
We've had a good run during this six-week period. This is our off-season a little bit, but I was just fascinated with... To you, Daryl. You you do a great job. I don't know. We've got a great staff and a great volunteer corps who make all this happen, but the art still has to hold itself on the walls, and so it's been fun. I got exceptionally good feedback, and for being fresh and different than what you're normal. Yeah, I think that's really the critical part of this is that we tried something a little different, a little more unique, and so... But still important and still very poignant. So I encourage everybody to go out to uh, the museumofwesternart.com if you're not already there and uh, not only see the book, read the essay by Leanne Watley, The Art of Suzanne Vincent, Glory and Grime. And Catherine, we're going to leave it to you for a final word about uh, Glory and Grime, The Art of Suzanne Vincent. Thoughts? A quote from Suzanne Gray Vincent, a painting requires a certain mystery, something undefined and a touch of fancy. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Now we have to write that one down for my quote wall that I've got. The Art of Suzanne Vincent, Glory and Grime. See it on our website at Museum of Western Art. And today's episode of It's Art, Let's Talk About It has featured Catherine Catherine McIntyre, Catherine Vincent McIntyre, and uh, Leanne Watley, who curated the show. And thank you both ladies for uh, playing along with helping the museum do another great show. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear.